faithfulness You never change And you never fail Oh God True are your promises True are your promises You never change
really helps us as we go through our life and our journey of finding Christ. Being a part of a church, it is a source of love, a source of strength, fellowship, and guidance as we again put forth our effort to follow Jesus. So, for us, 45 years ago, right there, yesterday, Priscilla and Richard got married right here. St. Andrews has been an integral part of our life in passing through the journey and our, again, our effort to follow Jesus. What way has church, whether St. Andrews or another church that you've been a part of, <clears throat> excuse me, how has it been a part of your life journey? How has it passed the time as you have gone on? How have you had the church integrated into your life? So now, let us pass the peace of Christ.
Tensibilidad. Esta es la palabra de Dios para el pueblo de Dios. Gracias, Señor. I would love to have all the children, or children if you're young at heart and at your age, come join us down here. Now we have a few things we're doing different, so if you're a child or a child that's young at heart and want to sit in the front row here, y'all come join me. That would be awesome. Because I want to tell you guys, today we're doing a story. Has anybody here ever heard of the three little pigs and the big bad wolf? Yes. Yeah? Have you ever heard of that? The three little pigs and the big bad wolf? That's a story we know. Well, guess what? We're not doing that one today. We're doing a different one. The three little wolves and the big bad pig. because this is a new story for me too. Just to see what happens in this story and make you think about what you can do every day. Once upon a time, there were three cuddly little wolves with soft hair and fluffy tails who lived with their mother. The first was black, the second was gray, and the third was white. One day, the mother called the three little wolves around her and said, My children, it is time for you to go out into the world, but beware of the big bad pig. Don't worry, mother, we will watch out for him, said the three little wolves, and they set off. Soon they met a kangaroo who was pushing a wheelbarrow full of red and yellow bricks. Please, will you give us some of your bricks, asked the three little wolves. Certainly, said the kangaroo, and she gave them lots of red and yellow bricks. So the three little wolves built themselves a house of bricks. The very next day, the big bad pig came prowling down the road <laughs> and saw the house of bricks that the little wolves had built. The three little wolves were playing croquet in the garden. When they saw the big bad pig coming, they ran inside the house and locked the door. The pig knocked on the door and grunted, little wolves, little wolves, let me come in. No, 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 said the three little wolves. By the hair on our chinny chin chins, we will not let you in, not for all the tea leaves in our china teapot. Then I'll huff, and I'll puff, and I'll blow your house down, said the pig. So he huffed, and he puffed, and he puffed, and he puffed, but the house didn't fall down. But the pig wasn't called big and bad for nothing. He went and fetched his sledgehammer, and he knocked the house down. only just managed to escape before the bricks crumbled, and they were very frightened indeed. We shall have to build a stronger house, they said. Just then, they saw a beaver who was mixing concrete in a concrete mixer. Please, will you give 
us some of your concrete? asked the three little wolves. Certainly, said the beaver, and he gave them buckets and buckets full of messy, slurry concrete. So the three little wolves built themselves a house of concrete. No sooner had they finished than the big bad pig came prowling down the road and saw the house of concrete that the little wolves had built. They were playing battle door and shuttlecock in the garden, and when they saw the big bad pig coming, they ran inside their house and shut the door. The pig rang the bell and said, Little frightened wolves, let me come in. No, no, no said the three little wolves. By the hair on our chinny-chin-chins, we will not let you in, not for all the tea leaves in our china teapot. Then I'll huff, and I'll puff, and I'll blow your house down, said the pig. So he huffed, and he puffed, and he puffed, and he huffed. But the house didn't fall down. But the pig wasn't called big and bad for nothing. He went and fetched his pneumatic drill and smashed the house down. <laughs> the three little wolves managed to escape, but their chinny chin chins were trembling and trembling and trembling. We shall build an even stronger house, they said, because they were very determined. Just then they saw a truck coming along the road, carrying barbed wire, iron bars, armor plates, and heavy metal padlocks. Please, will you give us some of your barbed wire, a few iron bars and armor plates, and some heavy metal padlocks, they said to the rhinoceros who was driving the truck. Sure, said the rhinoceros, and he gave them plenty of barbed wire, iron bars, armor plates, and heavy metal padlocks. He also gave them some plexiglass and some reinforced steel chains, because he was a generous and kind-hearted rhinoceros. So the three little wolves built themselves an extremely strong house. It was the strongest, securest house one could possibly imagine. They felt absolutely safe. The next day, the big bad pig came prowling along the road as usual. The three little wolves were playing hopscotch in the garden. When they saw the big bad pig coming, they ran inside their house, bolted the door, and locked all the 37 padlocks. The pig dialed the video entrance phone and said, Little frightened wolves with the trembling chins, let me come in. No, 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 said the little wolves. By the hair on our chinny chin chins, we will not let you in, not for all the tea leaves in our china teapot. <laughs> then I'll huff, and I'll puff, and I'll blow your house down, said the pig. So he huffed, and he puffed, and he puffed, and he huffed. But the house didn't fall down. But the pig wasn't called big and bad for nothing. He brought some dynamite, laid it against the house, lit the fuse, and the house blew up. The three little wolves just managed to escape with their fluffy tails scorched. Something must be wrong with our building materials, they said. We have to try something different. But what? At that moment, they saw a flamingo coming along, pushing a wheelbarrow full of flowers. Please.
please. Will you give us some flowers? Asked the little wolves. With pleasure, said the flamingo. And she gave them lots of flowers. So the three little wolves built themselves a house of flowers. One wall was of marigolds, one of daffodils, one of pink roses, and one of cherry blossoms. The ceiling was made of sunflowers, and the floor was a carpet of daisies. They had water lilies in their bathtub, and buttercups in the refrigerator. It was a rather fragile house, and it swayed in the wind, but it was very beautiful. Next day, the big bad pig came prowling down the road and saw the house of flowers that the three little wolves had built. He rang the bluebell at the door and said, little frightened wolves with the trembling chins and scorched tails, let me come in. No, 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 said the three little wolves. By the hair on our chinny chin chins, we will not let you in, not for all the tea leaves in our china teapot. Then I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house down, said the pig. But as he took a deep breath, ready to huff and puff, he smelled the soft scent of the flowers. It was fantastic. And because the scent was so lovely, the pig took another breath and then another. Instead of huffing and puffing, he began to sniff. He sniffed deeper and deeper until he was quite filled with a fragrant scent. His heart grew tender and he realized how horrible he had been. Right then he decided to become a big, good pig. He started to sing and dance the tarantella. <laughs> were a bit worried. It might be a trick. But soon they realized that the pig had truly changed. So they came running out of the house. They started playing games with him. First they played pig pong. And then piggy in the middle. And when they were all tired, they invited him into the house. <laughs> they offered him tea and strawberries and wolfberries and asked him to stay with them as long as he wanted. The pig accepted and they all lived happily together ever after. Friends, will you pray with and for me? 
Gracious, holy, and loving God, we give you thanks and praise for the opportunity to gather in your house this day. We thank you for the wisdom that's been shared with us over the course of the summer. Children's books contain those foundation building blocks upon which life is built. And we claim that we are all your children. May we all be lifelong learners of good lessons. May we receive them, may we teach them. And may your Holy Spirit continue to guide us in all of that work. This prayer we offer in Jesus' name and all those gathered said, Amen. Amen. Now, friends, I have some trepidation about following that, and you all continue to pay attention. Um, someone suggested I probably should have worn the dinosaur costume today, but um, can we say thank you again to our definite friend for coming on Friends, when the staff and lay leadership were invited to contribute to the summer reading series, Sarah was the first one to share the book, the lesson that you have heard, that we have heard today. I smiled because I was familiar with the book. It was a book given to me many years ago when Patrick was little by someone who stood with us on his day of baptism. David, speaking of ways in which the church has contributed to my life and the life of my family. The invitation, as she and I discussed the book at the time, was to recognize that among some things, not everything is necessarily as it seems. That we are invited to see beyond what is immediately in front of us. And a spirit of welcome goes a long, long way. And friends, we also know that as we read scripture and sometimes when we go back and we visit those children's stories, that something new comes to us again. And so as I read the story in preparation for this morning, what came to mind is, what house are you building? What house are we building individually and corporately? Friends, David has already mentioned that in a couple of weeks, we will begin an eight-week series exploring the work of Kay Katan, being a post-pandemic church in a post-pandemic world. And throughout those eight weeks, we will explore what are needed core competencies. And that might sound like a very big word and a very big phrase, but it's what knowledge or ability, what skills do we need to allow us as individuals and as a church to navigate this new land in which we find ourselves and to continue to bring the light of Christ into the world. And we're going to hear words like flexibility and courage, resilience, spiritual groundedness, being relational, relationality, being committed and visionary. And my hope is that these will be the building blocks upon which our house is rebuilt. Now friends, hear that word with me. Our house is Rebuilt. Someone recently asked me what my job was like these days. And I'm always one to consider word pictures because that makes sense to me. And I said I felt a bit like a homeowner who was taking the house back to the studs while living in it. Think about that for a minute. How many in this room have done a building renovation or a home renovation, small or large project? Raise your hand. And I feel that way. I feel like a homeowner in the midst of a building being taken back to the studs, the basic foundations, while trying to live in it. Now, friends, I trust that making that statement is going to make a few folks in here and online uncomfortable. Questions arise like, hasn't enough already been dismantled in this season? Who authorized this renovation? Where's the trustees? Who's going to pay for this renovation? What's it going to look like when it's done? Do we really need to make any changes? I like it just fine the way it is around here. But friends, I invite you to look around, literally and figuratively. Friends, the landscape has changed in this post, well, sort of post-pandemic world. And we are standing in new and somewhat uncharted territory. And I say some charted because I invite you to consider the words of the scripture read today from the prophet Isaiah. 
as David shared with us, the lesson from Isaiah 43 is written to the diaspora. Now that's another big word for this morning, and some of you may know what it means, but in case you don't, it simply means scattered. It was a letter written to the Hebrew children that had been scattered and taken from their homeland to Babylon. And the prophets and the sages throughout chapters 14 through 55, second Isaiah as it is known, addressed the people in exile, admonishing, encouraging, offering accountability, grace, and hope. And these verses remind us that even though they were not where they did not plan or want to be, that there was a promise that where they were, they would not remain. And while their new life and new place would look very, very different, that God's presence, direction, song, will, and place among them would not waver. Let me say that one more time. That God's presence, direction, solace, will, and place among them would not waver. So my friends, as we consider today's lessons from the three little wolves and the big good pig, and from Isaiah, I simply ask this, what house are we building? Are we wanting to rebuild what we've always known? Are we wanting to reinforce what has always been? Are we going to beef up some our security, buckle down to keep us in and, and others out? Or might in this time of rebuilding we consider what Paul described as a more excellent way? Because honestly, friends, I much prefer flowers. In the words of the prophet Isaiah from Eugene Peterson's telling, he writes, forget about what's happened. Don't keep going over old history. Be alert. Be present. I'm about to do something brand new. It's bursting out. Don't you see it? There it is. Now, friends, I know that there is a danger for some of us here that when we talk about what has been, we, we think that if we change, that somehow we have diminished all the good that came from that. I don't believe that's the case at all. Unlike the TNT that the good pig used, we're not blowing everything up to say amen. <laughs> when you take a house back to the studs, what do you do? You keep a good and solid foundation, amen? I trust that we will do that. So what is that foundation? I want to share for you just some words from our Bishop Ken Carter in a post that he made on social media a couple weeks ago. Actually, it was a week ago uh, yesterday. <laughs> He said, my view from the office this morning, an executive summary of what is happening. And at first he talks about, and some of you might have attended the future of the UNC meeting last week. Some of you may be up for the local conversation that we're going to have following worship this morning after our Montclair Fair. He writes this, that a departing group had filed lawsuits against the conference that encouraged withholding of apportionments and now threatens the filing of charges. And he goes on to explain the conference's response. And then the second paragraph, he says, at the same time, there is the power of God. The word is preached in almost 1,700 churches. The sacrament is shared. Kids went to camp this summer and met the Lord. Youth went on mission teams. Churches filled backpacks with essentials and blessed them. And by extension, the children and the created for teachers and schools. Clergy began new ministries in new places. They began to fall in love with their churches and vice versa. Other clergy went apart for a season of renewal. And when they returned, they saw with new eyes how blessed they were to be serving their congregations. I will say amen to that one. Campus ministries are welcoming students and providing a spiritual home. Bishop Carter concluded this way. He said, if I could influence you in any way, it would be to spend more time in the second paragraph and not in the first. He writes, tell the truth about the good things God is doing among us. Tune out the noise, avoid the trolls, name the false witness, and know that God is with us. Claim the power of your own story, and don't let others label you. Encourage someone. Pay attention to God's sightings. Plan for a future with hope. 
So in response, he invited folks to offer a second paragraph moment. And this was my response. Y'all ready? Say amen. amen. I realize I'm not as cute as a pig in a costume, <coughs> but y'all hang with me for just another minute. Thank you. I will. And you might have to put that back on because I think there's some folks that want pictures with you. <laughs> and now we're even. <laughs> so here was my response. Hundred and Blayton counties. If you know, you know. A semi-truck full of frozen treats. Popsicles and play. LHCC summer camp over 16 days, 75 families, 125 children, and a 10-year anniversary. A welcome just this past week to Montclair teachers who bring new friends. Courtney, thank you for being here this morning, you here, and your husbands. And old friends, Jennifer Moore, into our circle. A growing small group. Our cross-cultural ministries, did you know that it represents 12 different countries and 6 different languages? They're cross-cultural in their own right. And a choir. If you are a member of the choir, can you just like lift up your hands and praise? And if you are attached to a member of the choir that was here on Wednesday night, can you lift up your hands and praise? You know what? If you're just if you were here on Wednesday night, just stand up and turn around and look at the crowd for just a second. First of all, can we say thank you to the choir for what they do? Friends, this group of folks, y'all can be seated, thank you so much, put together over almost 700 sandwiches for a roof above. And friends, that's only a partial list. That's quite a second paragraph, is it not? Say amen. amen. And friends, that's not an exhaustive list. And friends, I don't say this to say, look at us, look at all the good things that we're doing. I am very proud of the work that is done at this church, but it is not to point to us, amen? amen. It is to point to the God whom we follow, who, if we remember from a couple weeks ago, gives us the seed by which all of this is made possible. And we do this in thanksgiving and praise so that others will come to know. So friends, I ask you, what house are we building? Friends, I invite you to pray for it and consider ways to partner in it. Because as I said earlier, I really like flowers. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all those gathered and said, so friends, we're going to invite the choir to return, and as they do, are y'all singing from there? Are you singing from up here? Are you singing from there? Oh, you're singing from the middle. Okay. The choir knows what everybody else knows what they're doing today, so we will have the opportunity, as we always do, to reflect and to respond to the word presented, to the word read, to the word prayed, to the word sung, to the word proclaimed. And I pray that as we come forward, that these are the words that will carry us and help us be mindful. And it's Eugene Peterson's telling again. Forget about what has happened. Don't keep going over old history. Be alert. Be present. For I am about to do something brand new in you, through you, for you. It's bursting out. May we all see it. Thank you, Cora.
As we continue in our worship and praise, we now come to the part where we recite the Lord's Prayer. We may do so in the language of your choice. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. to sing a final hymn soon, and it is in your bulletins on a sheet of paper. It's actually a mashup hymn of two hymns stuck together. One of them is probably more familiar to you than the other. We gather together, which we usually sing around Thanksgiving. This has different words this time, so pay attention to what's on your page. I heard that we ran out of bulletins this morning, which is kind of a big problem to have. So if you don't have a song sheet, just sidle up next to somebody who does. You can get out of your seat and move around. That's fine to find somebody. And Pastor Sherry, were we going to have people bring their things forward? Wonderful. So you may have observed all these backpacks at the front. Today is our blessing of the backpacks. As we get ready to go back to school and just start our kind of year together, um, we invite you, if you brought your backpack or your briefcase or your purse or your attache or any such thing that you bring with you, or your lunch bag, anything that you bring with you every day, um, we invite you to bring it forward and to be blessed and just bring it up during the hymn. All right, so here we go. Bless thou the gifts with We Gather Together.
purses that you carry every day, once a week, different bags for different places, and often they end up looking like this. Stuffed, full, and heavy, creating a burden that makes it hard to put it on. And every so often, you have to clean it out. And you find all kinds of prizes inside. And then you realize you have stuff that you don't need anymore. And you either trash it or file it or pass it on. And the next time you place that on, it's not so heavy anymore. The burden has been lifted. To me, that reminds me of the things I need to do every day in giving God my burdens and my weights. Be it your purse, your backpack, or your briefcase. The other thing that we often do is carry one of these. And we didn't include that in our list. And I had someone remind me this morning that this is very much so a burden, a weight, a joy, a celebration, an annoyance. Y'all can think of many other things. It's full of information. And that's what you use for work too, or for school, for learning. That needs to be given to God too. And allow Him to lift that from you. So that the things that you carry in your bag, the things that you carry in your purse, the things that you carry in your phone become a way to serve him. They become a way to build a house of flowers, a way to invite people in. Today, I have tags made that I want to share with you. And it was really funny how sometimes God works in our lives. The first thing it says, be kind. Thank you, Wolf, for learning to be, I mean, Pig, for learning to be kind and showing us the way. Serve others. Just what Christ has called us to do is to go out and serve others and be welcoming and caring. We have special guests here with us today that are going to share with you ways you can serve others in the world as Christ would have us do. And the last is share Christ. Build your house up with flowers. Invite others in to know who Christ is. Go out into the world and share Christ to all those that you meet. Knowing that the things that you use, the tools that you carry with you, have been blessed by God. And that He is taking on burdens for you so you can celebrate and praise Him each and every day. Let us pray. We come to you this morning, God, offering thanksgiving and praise and celebration for your great love for each and every one of us. We ask you to bless each and one of these bags and phones that they may become just simply a tool that we use to take the items we need to share our knowledge of you. We ask that you to bless those who are not here and those who did not bring things forward. Go out to Montclair School and be with each one of those children as they start their new day. Lift their fears. Lift their anxieties. Let them see the love that the teachers have to share. Let them learn and grow and know that kindness is one of the most important things that we can start each day with. Let each of us Learn to share love and share Christ in all that we do. Let each one of us pray for them in the morning so that the bags that they carry in are filled with hope and celebration. We ask you, God, to remember that each of us are here to serve you. And yeah, we're going to mess up. But that's why we have each other. So we can try, try again so that each day our house is filled with flowers that smell beautiful, that remind us to be kind, to serve, and to share you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray.
So I trust that after worship, there are a couple things to bring your attention to before we conclude in prayer. One, there we do have some special guests, as Sherry has indicated, that are going to be out in the hallway that can tell you a little bit more about connecting to Montclair. Now, I also understand we're a regional church. Many of you might have elementary schools a whole lot closer than Montclair. But I trust that you would still welcome our guests warmly, and you can share with them where you serve. And I bet you they can connect you. Say they're nodding back there, all right? So just because I don't, I'm, I'm not going to serve at Montclair, yeah, that does not give you a pass for today, friends. Say amen. Amen. I trust that you will at least greet everybody warmly and find out about what's going on in an elementary school, middle school, or high school in your area. Second, I trust that you will want to see Sherry because she got presents, and that's always a good thing. And then probably about 11.20, we are going to gather for a local conversation for those who are interested in the future of the UMC. Um, if you've attended last week's conversation, that may be helpful. Another one will be coming up in September. We'll have other opportunities. But I think we're going to try and fit into room 17, which is right down this hallway. We'll have to, we'll shift if we, if we run out of space in the room. But it is good that we have gathered here today. So I invite you to stand, please, for this prayer. These are words again from Bishop Carter. It's a prayer that he published for summertime, and it was back in 2000. But I trust that these words still ring true for us today. So hear these words and, turn and attune them to your hearts and to your spirits as well. God, of every time and season, we give you thanks for rhythms of work and rest, for places apart that mark our years for the eternal return of ocean waves for the defiant posture of mountains, for the hiddenness of favored coves, for pilgrimages made, and homecomings, and home goings. O oh God, in this season we are grateful for sanity regained, for blessings discovered, for those who return to us, and for those who leave. As we leave this place, teach us, God, of wonder and creation, that your presence is woven into all of the comings and goings of our lives. Let us return with Jesus to live, to work, to heal, to pray, to worship, and to love. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all those gathered said, Amen. Amen. Friends, go in peace.